There are successes, of course. I talk about Fatimata all the time. She is, um, I call her my foster daughter. It's not a formal relationship. She now has two children who are my grandchildren and call me grandma, but I'm not repeating that in any other environment. I am far too young to be a grandma, of course. <laughs> um, and she did go through higher education and came out of the other end. But it took a lot of support to get her to that position. Again, she survived the most horrific circumstances. Her family was slaughtered. She was dragged from her bed by the secret police in her home country. She, she obviously never saw her family again. She um, was put into prison herself. You can imagine what may have happened to her in prison. She then came, was smuggled into the UK. She didn't know she was in the UK when she arrived here didn't speak a word of English, she's now a qualified teacher. So um, what I don't want to do is suggest that everybody ends up in those same situations. But I do think that universities can do more to compensate for the absence of protective factors. I would urge that we move away from some of the sorts of um, the, the sorts of activities that look to locate development of uh, resilience um, in terms of thinking only about inner resources. So I think we can do more to offer forms of family capital. The university can operate as a family here. We can offer community activities and make sure that people are actually um, engaged in those things because a lot of these students, they don't necessarily come from circumstances where those things are obvious. So things like volunteering in the community, um, doing those sorts of activities which for maybe more middle class students are, are just part of their, their psyche about the ways of being in the world. Some of those things just don't, they don't understand necessarily. I keep using they and I'm really conscious of the fact I'm using they and I hope I've tried to offer the diversity of the voices I'm talking for, so apologies for that. So there are lots of things that we can be doing. I don't like, as you can tell, activities that help build resilience, that focus on the individual developing their character. Previous university I worked in put all of their students on particular courses through outdoors, outward bound activities. I think it's really problematic. A little aside, just before I became a professor, we were offered the opportunity to go on a leadership course and it said people who are thinking about applying for their personal chairs at some point may find this course useful. When I was face down in the mud in the Lake District, I can tell you I did not find that <laughs> useful. Anyway. Um, um, I also think counselling services do a marvellous job but not if the focus is solely on the, the inner resilience of the individual so we have to be a little bit cautious sometimes there. Specifically what we can do, um, I've talked about some of those things but I think we really need to be thinking about time. Tolerance and patience are really important for the students that I've been talking about. They need long inductions. Their ways of thinking about the future may be very different than other students. Students from low socioeconomic backgrounds do not have the same ways of thinking about uh, into the future as, as more affluent students do. They're often coming from backgrounds where they've been living hand to mouth, their families are paid weekly, they pay rent monthly, they don't have 25 year mortgages, they don't save up for holidays three years in advance and so on. So there's different sorts of temporalities going on that I think universities sometimes don't recognise and there's sometimes a need to think differently. We need to help students develop that very concrete understanding of what they can possibly be in the future and the other things that I've talked about here that I'm not going to go into um, because I'm conscious of time. I've used Tara Yosso's work a lot in, in my work and I'm going to come back to that in a minute after I've talked a little bit about mattering. Have I got time to talk about mattering? You don't want to shut up, right? Julian told me how to talk about this. So um, this is some work that I'm doing at the moment, thinking about taking some of the concepts of resilience a little bit further and working specifically with refugees to think about how universities can operate at places within, as places within which people can feel that they matter. Um, and I'm specifically using that term, I've worked around using the concept of belonging and fitting in, but I find the concept of mattering actually more helpful. So um, the research that I'm doing with refugees is, is, has started from the position that a lot of the times people flee their home countries, and Syria I think is a very different circumstance because you're talking about a whole country here, but quite often individual refugees are fleeing because they may have ceased to matter um, to the sort of authorities, so they, they've, they've fallen into conflict with the law, so their, their right to be an individual in that society has become fractured, etc. So 
seeking and gaining asylum can offer that potential to develop new forms of validation and new forms of mattering, but it can also disrupt the actual process of asylum itself, can disrupt that sense of mattering. So when people may have felt that they've ceased to matter in their home countries in that process, and we can see that in the ways in which people are being victimised and exploited to actually cross the channel um, or to, to cross the Mediterranean Sea in particular, that there's something about the process of asylum that can actually confound those uh, feelings of not mattering to others. Before the situation in Syria, about 40% of refugees who came to the UK, or people who came to the UK claiming asylum, uh, about 40% of those will either have got a higher education qualification or will have been professionally qualified or both in their home country. So contrary to a lot of the discourses about these feckless, idle um, people, etc., they have historically been pretty well-educated people, unsurprisingly because quite often those are the people that fall foul of those governments, so lawyers, teachers, health workers, doctors, maybe the people that come into conflict with authority. Um, so many refugees will see universities as places of hope because they will feel that they can re-establish themselves uh, in their new sort of social environment and re-validate themselves as people who matter to others through higher education. So just talking a little bit about the concept that I'm using. So mattering is that perception that we make a difference to others and it is subjective in the same way that resilience uh, is as well. Um, but it can also operate as that external validation as well and it can operate at an individual and a community level. It's very much uh, informs the way we think about ourselves and I think the way we think about who are, we are and our identity and it can help in our social integration. So you can superficially belong to a group, which is why I've moved away from the idea of belonging in higher education, because you can superficially be part of a social group, but you can still feel you don't matter. So there's something about the internal processes that are going on there to help you think that you really belong. There's four distinct elements. My work at the moment uh, is building on these four, four, which are attention, importance, dependence, and then appreciation, to also include, and Sam will be pleased about this, the concept of care, uh, which I think is mattering from some of that there. So I've been looking at a different data set of 60 interviews, uh, specifically with refugees, <coughs> some of whom are in prison, particularly asylum seekers, actually, some young unaccompanied uh, asylum seekers, and the rest of them either trying to access or in higher education. And I predominantly use narrative, um, either different forms of narrative, uh, but it's all based around sort of stories of experience. Some of it's been collected um, specifically thinking about belonging, but not all of it. And I'm analysing that data using those four elements of mattering that I've talked about before. Um, so, attention, which is the first one. So, that's the feeling that you command the interest or notice of another person. What these students that I'm talking to have spoken about persistently is the feeling of being invisible or being hyper-visible because of the discourses around fundamentalism and terrorism on campus. So, simultaneously invisible but also very visible, particularly Muslim students. Um, They've talked a lot about having been people who um, received attention, so they've been doctors, lawyers, teachers, and then they've lost it. And there's a very strong sense of longing for the past, and also a sense of uh, quite significant loneliness because of that feeling of not mattering to other people, and because of that, a loss of identity as well. So I'm just going to go through a few quotes. Um, so Shakia, I sit on my own, I study on my own, I socialise on my own, it's like I'm a ghost. I could disappear and no one here would notice, in fact a ghost might be more noticed than I am. No one notices me here, before when I was in my country I was somebody, a, a something, a somebody, here I'm nothing, a nobody, a person without a past, a faceless person. This idea of being a ghost is really prevalent in these narratives with refugees, there's something um, quite significant in the ways in which they talk about themselves as being quite insubstantial and you can see it there in the sort of concept of the faceless person as well. Um, so the second area of mattering is around importance. So a bit of Bourdieu, you've got to have a dead French philosopher at least one point in a presentation. I, <laughs> this is Bourdieu for you. Um, so the feeling of counting for others, 
um, being important for them and because of that for oneself, etc. But here, what the refugees talked about is that people just weren't interested in them. They felt very keenly loss of status, again, because most of them had been, they'd had uh, professional positions in their home countries. They had that sense of constantly beginning again, that life was a series of new beginnings over and over again. And it really made them feel, um, it, it threatened their sense of who they were and their role within their families. So Imran, um, I went over to sit with them. As soon as I did it, they stopped talking. There was silence. They changed the subject, started talking about something else. I was a doctor in Iran. Iran a clinic was needed, useful. I'm not important. Without being, without being a doctor, I don't know who I am. And that, that sense of loss really did come up a lot. Third one is dependence. Um, that it's not about who depends on you, not about you depending on others, it's about them depending on you. So it's a two-way position that you need to be in. And these, what these refugees were talking about was the fact that because they had very problematic um, circumstances in relation to their family, that no one felt, there didn't seem to be people around them that were depending on them. A lot of refugees have a lot of connections with family and it's the best thing. Facebook is one of the best things that's ever happened to refugees, I have to say. It's how my foster daughter found parts of her family through Facebook. Um, so quite often refugees will have families, but they will be very disconnected for those families as well. Um, I'm doing a project about people who are estranged from their families at the moment and refugees come into that so they're both connected and not connected. Um, they feel very keenly a desire to be needed but that's often not um, how they're seen in higher education and that's partly because they're mature learners often and they feel that nothing they've brought with them is valued in terms of skills, attributes or knowledge. So it matters to me, I want to be part of a group, it has to be two ways, no one wants me to join them. Or well, the second student, Hassan, no one needs anything from me and that's sad. And then finally, appreciation. The beliefs people have that they matter to someone else. They're the object of somebody else's attention. What these students talked about was being ignored, being rejected, being undervalued and being silent. So in terms of appreciation, sum together all the things from the first three. How can that be? How can they say, come here, we want people of all different faiths and religions and beliefs. We're happy to have you all. Then when you're here, it's like there's nothing. You can be a quiet Muslim, a silent Muslim, but please don't want us to support you being a real Muslim. And then this is my foster daughter and this is when I first got to know her. I speak three languages. I'm a single parent, a former refugee. I learned English from scratch. I went to, be, to FE college. I trained to be a nursery assistant. I worked since I could. That means nothing here. And that's when she just uh, um, first started in higher education. So if you don't feel that you matter, then it can in itself lead to students feeling a sense of anxiety and depression. I've talked about refugees here. I could have substituted that for many other groups in higher education. I think there's some fundamental issues for retention and success of students not feeling that they matter. And because of that, I think there's implications for social justice and equity. I don't want to say that refugee students are not agentic, that is not the case at all and I hope I've talked a little bit at the beginning about some of the ways in which they've strived to succeed in their lives. Um, they do work round and through those exigencies, they do develop new forms of support and this is where I come back to Tara Yasso's work, they bring to higher education different forms of community cultural wealth, the problem is that those are not often recognised. And also, I would like to say that sometimes when they drop out of higher education, that's an agentic action as well. And that can be something that's quite positive and a form of resistance or resilience. I'd like to sort of start to move to the end of this talk, mainly because I need a drink. Um, not an alcoholic one, just a drink of water. Um, so hopeful ways forward. Um, a lot of the refugees I've talked about have talked about higher education, specifically using the term hope, that these are places of hope. The literature says that institutions that focus on mattering and student involvement, involvement will be more successful in creating campuses where students are motivated to learn. But I think we can go beyond that. It's not just about learning, it's about all the other things that higher education should be about. So I would argue that 
whatever stage of, of student work we're doing, whether it's outreach and access work, whether it's transitions, pedagogy, successful em uh, outcomes into employment or degrees, etc., we can reframe what we're doing in terms of those four areas of resilience. And as I say, I'm starting to think because of Sam's um, work my, Sam's one of my doctoral students who's work around care, rethinking some of this to do with care as well. Um, and I do think we should start to ask very specific reflective questions of our practice. I'm not going to go through all of these. These slides um, I'm happy to send round to everybody. But I think if we take Yosso's seven areas of community cultural wealth, as she calls it, and think about um, each of those and ask those questions of our practices. It doesn't matter whether we're academics teaching or whether we're working in outreach or whether we're working in employability, whatever. If we ask ourselves these sorts of questions around aspirational capital, linguistic capital, etc., then we can actually reflect on whether the practices that we're putting in place are actually the practices that recognise what students bring with them, or are we still making assumptions about who our students are and the forms of wealth that we actually valorise in higher education. And we've got to stop, it might be that all of you in the room have never done this, but I think I've got to stop making some of those assumptions too, and I see it happen quite often. Um, so you can go away and you can think about these if you want to in terms of your own practice. The social capital is the fourth of those. Navigational capital as well. Um, you can write and ask yourself your own reflective questions, but obviously if these will have help for you, then please do shamelessly steal them. And then think about resistance and resilience. Um, how do we recognise what those students have done in terms of getting into higher education? We often are reluctant to ask their stories, either through fear of breaching some form of privacy or because we actually worry about eulogising those stories in ways that are not particularly helpful. But I think there are things that we can do and we can help students to draw on that resistant capital to become more academically buoyant. So I wouldn't use the term academic resilience, I would use the term academic buoyancy here. I think they're very, very different things um, and I hope that I've made that point at the beginning. So, ending. Um, my work, I think, has shown that many students have overcome barriers in higher education, but rather than it being a place of hope that they hoped it to be, it becomes a place of adversity. And we can't continue to locate change just within students. We need to press back against some of these deficit discourses. We need to argue against my growth mindset and character education and grit. They may have their place, I'm yet to be convinced, but they must not become any more pervasive, particularly in higher education than they already are. Instead, we need to change higher education practices so that we're developing the external protective factors that can help our students be resilient and enhance their sense of mattering to us as higher education practitioners. And in doing that, one of the ways forward is to recognise the capital that the students bring with them. Thank you.